You said something to me once, though, about being on the road, um, and you had finally gotten to the point where you learned that it wasn't party time anymore and that it really was work. But what I wonder is, how do you stop from being bored? I know getting on stage every night is fabulous, but the 23-hour wait to get there, how do you get through you, that? Well, I mean, I guess every band has their different sort of little things to kill bored. There's no real way to actually completely get rid of the boredom but I found what we did this time on our long on our three-year tour as though we we brought our guitars you know like in the bus and stuff so therefore we had and at three in the morning we'd be driving down the highway we'd be playing slide guitar and open tuning it's like something that we learned to do because we were so bored we had nothing else to do except play guitars and think about music and that way it, it I think it brought the band closer number one in songwriting and in everything and in just in complete involvement and uh, and it just showed I think we learned a lot more as far as musicians I mean I feel like I've come an extreme an extremely long way from uh, when I started out with the Black Hearts I mean I real I can recognize the parts the songs that we've written for this album there the rhythm parts that I write for myself are harder than the ones I wrote previously you know for other albums I mean it's gonna be more difficult for me to learn how to play you know play them and sing them at the same time and get the same results is that something you did consciously just to challenge yourself or did it just come naturally because now just, you're better you no know, it was something I wanted to do it was like all of a sudden I you know I wanted to play slide guitar I wanted I ran out and bought a slide you know, I ran out and bought a cheap acoustic guitar. I ran out and bought, you know, a cheap book on slide guitar and, you know, open tuning and shows you how to tune to d d different, you know, things. And I just played by ear. I didn't really copy anybody or anything, and I don't really know how to play it, but it's, it kills the boredom. You know, it, it gives you something to do and something to practice. Do you, you know? ever get caught up on your sleep? I mean, three-year tour, think about that. That's... Well, it's, well, first of all, you got to realize that the being on the road is so diff such a different lifestyle from not being on the road. I mean, you get into a completely different frame of mind, and uh, you never think of the actual hard work, and neither does anybody else, including the fans. They don't realize. They think you really, you know, just don't do anything all day, and you get up on stage for an hour and a half, and that's that, and it's not. That's where you get tested. That's where you're really tested whether or not you can handle it or not. You get your dream. You get what well, you know. Your your fame. You're in front of a lot of people. You can you, just exactly what you wanted, you know. And uh, but then you didn't see all the pitfalls like no sleep, <laughs> no eat, no anything else. And um, that's where you're being tested. And it's like, can you put up with the no sleep? Can you take care of yourself? Can you work around it? Or do you have the will to work around it and keep yourself in shape and do stuff like that? And I do. I've been determined, you know, since I was 15, and I never, ever gave up. I mean, as much as everyone laughed at me, and, and you know that. I mean, it's like people did laugh, and they did, and they did, and maybe it wasn't the right time. But I didn't give up. We've talked about this with the Runaways, and, you know... Um... I had said to you that the reason I think that some people, well, I know myself, had not particularly maybe understood what it was that you were trying to do was because I thought that the package it was presented as by the people who were hyping it made it seem like it was this kind of very calculated thing, which you said, in fact, it wasn't at all. No. And, you know, you were in love with it, and yes. it was an important band, and you were just so excited to be in a band, and it was your whole life. Um, and yet, probably there were people who couldn't take the idea of an all-girl band playing tough, gutsy rock and roll. Do you think that if that band was the same way and playing now, it would be any different? I mean, you've got the Go-Go's now. It's a very cute little band. It's not playing the same kind of I music. I think the Runaways play. would be slammed from here Still. around the world. Because there, because you just it would be like another it would be four more of me, speaking the truth, and everyone would just say shut up again, 
Kim Fowley did not tell us how to dress, how to talk, how to do anything. We did what we, what we wanted to do. And when he got on the phone, I don't know what he said to <laughs> other people. But, I mean, as far as what the Runaways did and, and the songwriting and stuff like that, that was us. That was, you know, us writing the songs and, and doing the interviews and speaking for ourselves. And, and that was us. It was an unbelievable education for you, though, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you know what it's like, a 17-year-old girl storming into the president of our, our record company saying, where the hell's our tour support? <laughs> you know, it was just like, unheard of. How did you hear that song, I Love Rock and Roll? What was, how did you happen to come and record it? Didn't somebody else record it? Yeah, well, a band called The Arrows. It was, a, right. I, I suppose, part of something? English and part American. And uh, I saw, I was there, I was in England in 1976 with the Runaways on our first English tour, and we were watching TV. I don't know, I was in my room watching TV, and uh, they only have two channels. It's not that, you know, <laughs> much to look at, so... Oh, their television's the worst, isn't it? It's yeah. like how to decorate a plate yeah. or something on Eight the war. Eight o'clock, prime time, <laughs> lifespan of a moth, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> but I turned on this uh, in the afternoon, you know, a lot of the kids shows and stuff have videos and they showed uh, this band called the arrows and they were doing the b-side of their single and the b-side was called i love rock and roll so i went out to the record store and bought that single with the b-side i love rock and roll and took it home for the runaways to do it but we never did it for some reason and um, after the runaways broke up i did it with steve jones and paul cook just to have the song down you know, as something to play for people, which everybody did here in America. And uh, that's satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then, uh, you know, the Black Hearts were formed and we recorded it as soon as uh, we went in to make an album. I think it was the first cut, in fact. There's been a lot written about your struggles um, to get a record deal. And I think you make fun of it also in your video. You know, the Bad Reputation video, which <laughs> But it really was like that, wasn't it? I mean, it's, everybody turning it down and saying, forget it, for one reason or another, and now they would all sign you in a minute, wouldn't they? But that's exactly what it's like all the time, well, with every band. I mean, I'm sure... I, I wonder how many bands have gone... Well, the Beatles went through I it. Mean, a lot, I mean, a lot <laughs> of the bands Stones out went there, it. Yeah. you know, get turned down, and they can relate to that sort of situation. It's ridiculous. It's really, really ridiculous. You know, it's that that these people don't get out of um, their chairs to go see what the kids really want to hear. You know, they don't. They won't take the time out. No, well, they can't come in from the suburbs. It's too late at night on the weekends. Well, they, they better. Go to otherwise, they're going to lose but their job. But they never have, and they never will. And now, you know, they feel they don't have to. Now, all they care about is they can uh, make videos. You and know, hope that they'll stay alive. Lisa, the thing I found out that that. I don't think that the, the kids, the fans, the actual fans realize how much power they got. You the know, kids the song, have yes, yeah. like with the song like I Love Rock and Roll. You know, I mean, a lot of pe uh, radio people love that song, but the kids, they bombarded every station in the country with that. You know, saying, we want to hear that. I mean, that shows you the, pa the power they have. Stations that don't, didn't want to play the song had to, because they, they, every kid in, would, would, in the city would like throw bricks through the window if they didn't, you know? I mean, it was like the, the kids don't understand what sort of power they've got. It's really, it's nice to see that. In a certain way, it gives them confidence that they're not being controlled by this society. If they can realize that they brought something like I Love Rock, rock and Roll to number one around the world, not just in the United States. Did you travel through Europe on a bus? Yes, we did. Cause yeah, I, most I, of the time we traveled on a bus. And we drove uh, from, the, let's see, uh, West Germany to the GDR in a bus. You East, performed I mean, in West Easter? To, yeah, East Germany. Why did you do that? Because they, they said we could, and I wanted to. And it seemed like there was no, th no threat of danger at all. And they wanted us to come, and they gave us a city. They said, you'll play two nights here in Weimar, at Weimar Halle. And we said, great. We went through the Checkpoint Charlie. And uh, it was the most 
Unbelie- I mean, you talk about kids starved for music. Hmm. But what really blew my mind was when we were singing and we were doing the shows. And these kids, they never saw like live rock and roll or anything like that. So they don't know, well, like, if you try and tell them to clap, you know, like, they don't know how to clap in time. I always feel like we're doing something good when you leave a, a, a gig and you know that there's kids smiling and having a good time and, and you drive away from the concert and you hear people whooping it up and yelling and screaming because you know you did a, a good job and everyone's happy and having a good time. But when we went to East Germany and we were done with that show and those kids, it was like they never saw anything like that in their lives. And uh, I was like on the verge of tears and I was just like putting my hand up against the glass of the bus, you know, and they were all just like putting their hands up just so they could feel. And like we, we spent hours just giving anything we could find that was not illegal to give them, you know, like buttons and stickers and things that didn't mean anything that it was just ours. There's this misconception, I think, because, you know, on your albums you have special thanks to mentors right? Steve mm-hmm. Lieber, Bill Kerbishley, mm-hmm. and there was a very close association between you and your manager, Kenny Laguna, and right. I think if people don't know better, they might think that you're like this puppet being pulled by these people. Glad you brought that up. Oh, you are? <laughs> yes, I am. Well, you're not uh, like that, obviously. No, it's definitely not, definitely not a pu- puppet situation or a Svengali situation or anything like that. I mean, uh, Steve Lieber and, and Bill Kerbishley have been named as mentors and friends and consultants. That's exactly what they are. And they're not my consultants. They're Kenny's consultants, you know, that he talks to. And it's got, you know, it's got nothing to do with, uh, you know, what the band does personally and stuff. I think the fact that Gary and Lee and Ricky and myself are so close makes it easier for us to write songs, to sit down and decide what kind of beat we want to do, you know, the things like this, you know, the, the, we, it's much more of a band that way, it's a band, you know, I want to hear it called the Blackhearts, and know that it's, you know, they already know that Joan Jett's in the Blackhearts, instead of saying Joan Jett, and then saying, well, what about the Blackhearts, you know, it's like, it's the Blackhearts, and you know, it's, um, and Kenny is part of that, right. and a lot of people don't realize it. You know, he may, he may not be physically there on stage in the lights, but a lot of times he is there on stage. He doesn't play things on mm-hmm. stage, but he plays things on the records, and he, you know, helps arrange things with the band, and he's, I think he's a big, big part of the band. Yeah. It's kind of, it's like having a gang, isn't it? Yes, I mean, it is. It's a, it's a gang. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, like a little uh, combat unit. What's the record like? I th- I think it sounds tremendous. I really do. You know, I wasn't I wasn't really sure, and I did this the same thing with uh, I Love Rock and Roll and Bad Reputation. I would sit there and listen to the both of them and go, Does it stand up? Is it as good? Is does it do the same thing? You know, and then finally I realized, Yeah, it is good. It is good. It is a good. It's a good album. And then I did the same thing with this, and you know, and. I think it's a really powerful album, a really powerful album. I think it stands up easily, definitely, and I think you can hear growth in, the, in just like you were saying, an extension just from playing all those gigs, those 618 gigs every night. Da, 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 da. It's like you'd think it's like practice, but it's not because you're in front of an audience practicing and you get better because you have to do everything completely off the cuff and, all, and completely spontaneous. So if all of a sudden you want to try a, a Chuck Berry lead guitar, you got to do it right then and there. You can't, don't have a second chance, and it's a, it's a good way to learn. It, it really is a good way to like learn just by going for it. If you're, if you're willing to make an asshole out of yourself, I mean, or what you would think was an asshole out of yourself on stage, you know, I think that makes the audience feel much more comfortable with you. But do they know? I mean, they don't know if you... They, they, most of the time they don't, but a lot of people do. I mean, I mean, there are times when bands do make mistakes on stage. Some of them try to cover them up. Some of them admit them. And I, I find that the bands that admit 
the fact they made a mistake, they, they, that's more of an icebreaker instead of trying to hide the fact that you made a human error, you know, and it's like,